That was a very nice introduction. <laughs> Thank you. <clears throat> we all appreciate everyone and all the help. No, this, this is a, truly a team because nobody could have done any of this without the combined help of all. And, of course, with the combined help of God's blessing and, and inspiration. <clears throat> In Acts, we're told about the Bereans. The Bereans were a group of people who lived in an ancient Greek city. The city is, is called in the Bible Berea. Uh, now they call it by another name, but it was during the time of Paul, it was Berea. And uh, it's called V-E-R-I-A. And of course, Ray was recently over in Greece. I don't know if you heard of that city, Berea, Berea. But uh, if you did, that's where the Bereans used to be. Acts 17, verse 10 through 12, I'm going to read. And the brethren immediately sent away Paul and Silas by night unto Berea, who, coming thither, went into the synagogue of the Jews. These were more noble than those in Thessalonica, in that they received the word with all readiness of mind, and searched the scriptures daily whether those things were so. Therefore, many of them believed, also of honorable women, which were Greeks, and of men, not a few. The scriptures that Paul was quoting were, of course, from the Old Testament, because the New Testament hadn't been compiled or even being finished. It wasn't even finished being written, let alone put together. And to make checking on a scripture, which was the Old Testament only, it was a lot more complicated because... You know, it wasn't broken down into chapter and verse like it is now. That didn't happen for another thousand years before they added numbers to it. So when Paul said something and the Bereans searched the scriptures to see if it was so, that meant a lot of reading. They really had to page through or scroll through. <laughs> Different kind of scroll, wasn't it? They received the word with all readiness of mind and searched the scriptures daily whether those things were so. They wanted proof. I mean, they, they, they basically thought Paul was telling the truth, I believe, but they wanted to prove it. They couldn't just turn to a quoted verse because there were no verses, were there? And, of course, because they searched for more than, uh, you know, searched the scriptures daily, that implies that they searched for more than a single day. Yeah, you know, it wasn't just a quick page through. They searched for days to prove what Paul said was true and accurate. What would the Bereans have thought if they were told that in the future, all they had to do was ask Google or Siri <laughs> to find what Paul said, and we would have the proof in the palm of our hands in a matter of seconds? Have we got a good or what? <laughs> it took them days to verify what Paul preached was in the scriptures. I call this the Berean message because in many cases, I'll read the entire chapter, what I quote. And I'll try to slow down. My grandson says I go too fast and he can't turn to it quick enough. <laughs> so I'll try to give, write it down uh, and some I will read, which are okay then, but uh, others I'll just give you a reference and I'll summarize what I'm covering so you'll just have the scripture written down and you can check it later just like the Bereans did if I tried to read them all we might have trouble catching this boat this afternoon because <laughs> some of them are pretty, pretty long chapters <clears throat> Jesus Christ is called the Prince of Peace during his thousand year reign on this earth he will establish peace through a just government with the Ten Commandments as the basis of law, and himself as King of Kings. He is the King of Kings. There's going to be other kings under him. He came the first time to do what we read in Hebrews 2, verses 9 through 15, and I'll read this, Hebrews 2, verses 9 through 15. <clears throat> but we see Jesus, who was made a little lower than the angels for the suffering of death crowned with glory and honor, that he, by the grace of God, should taste death for every man. For it became him for whom are all things, 
and by whom are all things, in bringing many sons unto glory, to make the captain of their salvation perfect through suffering. For both he that sanctifies and they who are sanctified are all of one, for which cause he is not ashamed to call them brethren, saying, I will declare thy name unto, thy breth to, unto my brethren in the midst of the church. Will I sing praise unto thee? And again, I will put my trust in him. And again, behold, I and the children which God has given me. For as much then as the children, that was verse 14, I'm on now. For as much then as the children are partakers of flesh and blood, he also himself likewise took part of the same, that through death he might destroy him that had the power of death. That is the devil. And deliver them who through fear of death were all their life, lifetime subject to bondage. Jesus is the captain of salvation. That's kind of a strange term, but we were captives to sin and its penalty, which is death. That's what he delivered us from. And just who in this world has the power of death now? We just read that Satan, the devil, has the power of death. A lot of people, you know, he is the God of this world. He has the power of death. Jesus frees us from the one who has the power of death when he destroys the devil. That's what we just read, isn't it? You can read it again. There is a coming kingdom revealed by the gospel that Jesus brought from the Father. Remember, gospel just means good news. In a prayer to the Father just before he was crucified, Jesus said, For I have given unto them the words which you gave me. That is in John 17, verse 8. He revealed that he is the great I am that dealt with Moses and others throughout history. He stated that the scriptures cannot be broken. That's in John 10, 35. He was talking about Old Testament scripture because the New Testament hadn't been made yet or put together. At no time did Jesus disagree with the Heavenly Father, but that the world may know that I love the Father, and as the Father gave me commandment, even so do I. That is in John 14, verse 31. Like I said, you write the scripture down, then you can check what I say, whether it is there. It is... It is called good news. Well, how good is it? But as it is written, I has not seen nor ear heard, neither have entered into the heart of man the things which God has prepared for them that love him. That's in 1 Corinthians 2, verse 9. So now, do you see why I'm calling it the Berean thing? <laughs> Look it up. For now we see through a glass darkly, but then face to face. Now I know in part, but then sh shall I know even as also I am known. That is in 1 Corinthians 13, 12. It's news that's so good that the human mind can barely begin to comprehend it. I mean, we can't even understand infinity. Our spiritual understanding is very limited as humans. When Jesus returns, all who have died in the faith will be resurrected and joined by the living faithful to rise and meet him in the air, in the clouds. Among those resurrected will be Moses and Elijah, at least three of the apostles. I think they're probably all going to be, but in the vision, Peter, James, and John, we know that's because that's what they saw. Jesus told them they were going to see it before they died. And that was in Luke 9, 27 through 32. David will be a prince in Israel. I mean, I've always, always heard he'll be a king in Israel, but I looked it up, and it does say prince, not king. But he might be a That's a matter of uh, what terminology, I guess. Ezekiel 34, verses 23 through 28. The 12 apostles will be judges over the 12 tribes of Israel. That is in Matthew 19, 28. 
Others who have been persecuted, even murdered, because they believed and upheld the truth of God, will also be kings and priests on this earth for a thousand years. This is talking about the millennium, of course. I, I don't think, if I may be wrong, but I don't think the word millennium actually occurs in the Bible, but the thousand years does, and then in translation we get to the word millennium. All these will be spirit at that time, having eternal life. They will make up the government of God. And the educational system that will be will take control of this whole world as well. They will be the teachers of mankind. Revelation 5, verse 10. Revelation 20, verse 4 through 6. Jesus is coming to destroy those who are destroying the earth. Of course, who's at the top of the list? Satan. Revelation 11, verse 18. God's spirit will be available to all who are still living, who are still human beings, to lead them to appreciate the perfect law of liberty, the way that leads to peace. You'll find that summed up in Joel 2, 27 through 29. And... In James chapter 1, verse 25, and in Luke 1, 78 through 79. Early on, a temple will be, built, will be built just north of Jerusalem. It is described in detail as Ezekiel saw it, and the surrounding area and vision, he saw all of this and described it in Ezekiel, and I won't <laughs> read all of it. Ezekiel chapter 40 through 49. And no, I'm not going to read all nine chapters. That's why I say this is like homework, I guess. But I'll sum up what it tells you, what it says to make it, you know. Sometimes when I read a real long chapter, I can't remember what I started with when I get to the ending. So at any rate, the temple will house <coughs> the very throne of God. A stream from under the temp temple will rapidly become a large river and flow into the Dead Sea. Mr. Faulkner talked about the Dead Sea in the Bible study seminar that uh, he did. And that was very good. I wish more people had been able to attend that. Water will be abundant and so pure, pure that it will heal the formerly polluted waters wherever it flows. Because there's no fish in the Dead Sea. There's, in fact, probably microorganisms are the only thing that's there. It's like 10 times denser than salt water. It will be teeming with fish at this time. That's in, in part of the chapter I quoted, Ezekiel 47, 8 through 12. The deserts will bloom. Descendants of those who persecuted God's servants will come to submit to God's way. You'll find that written in Isaiah 60, 13 through 14. Wasteland shall become like Eden. That's spoken of in Isaiah 51, verse 3. All will d dwell in safety with nothing, making, uh, uh, with nothing to make anyone afraid anymore. You'll find that in Ezekiel 34, 28. And again, there's, there's no way to catch up with me on the reading. That's why I say write the scripture down and see you, what this says. And, well, the short ones you can, but those with handicaps will, will be healed routinely. The blind will be, receive good vision. The deaf will gain the ability to hear well. The lame will leap for joy, and the deaf will sing praises to, to, to the God who is love. We can read all that, about that in Isaiah 35, 5 through 6. And in 1 John 4 through 16. Kings and important leaders will come from all points of the world to serve and learn the system that produced this kingdom. And that, that will work to spread it around the world. That's, we're told that in Isaiah 49, 20, verse, uh, yeah, verse 22 and 23. There will be an exodus to Jerusalem at this time. 
the exodus will be of the physical sons and daughters of those who were resurrected, the ones that are, they were too young to receive the uh, conversion into spirit being. And they will, the, the, there will be an exodus to Jerusalem of the still physical sons and daughters of those in the first resurrection from all parts of the earth where they were at the return of Christ. It will make the exodus from Egypt in, insignificant by comparison. Read about that in Jeremiah 23, verses 7 and 8. Now, Satan will be bound and unable to deceive anyone. And for he, anyone for the thousand-year period, as we read about in Revelation 20, verse 2. During this millennium, with Satan bound for a thousand years, the earth will be restored to a paradise-like condition, restored like Eden, the Garden of Eden. But this isn't the end of the good news, the gospel. The first resurrection is spoken of as the better resurrection, Hebrews 11.35. But there is a larger resurrection at the end of the thousand years. That's in Revelation 20, verse 5. This is a res resurrection that will include all who have died and were not in the first resurrection, those who've never heard the truth. God's Spirit will be available to them also to enable them to understand His promises and help them learn the way to peace. That's in Ezekiel 37, the whole chapter. When they see the earth has been transformed into a paradise, I would say nearly, I mean, it's hard to imagine anyone who wouldn't repent, but, uh, but certainly most will accept that, and, and they will know that the way to live, the way of God is to follow his rules, his laws, his instruction, and to receive the wonderful results that they can see happen. This resurrection and time depicted as the last day by Jesus will include all who died before they ever had a chance to learn about the truth, about the gospel of the kingdom. Those who died before they had a chance to even hear the name of Jesus. And no doubt there's millions or billions who've never even heard the name, let alone understood it. Now that Satan is bound, the devil can no longer blind the minds to understanding. The absence of Satan's influence will prove that he is responsible for inciting pure evil in this world. For, thou for thousands of years, the earth and all life will, be, will recover and flourish. For, for a thousand years, it will have time to recover and flourish without Satan's influence to stir things up and cause disasters. You know, he's, there's got to be a reason why he's called the prince of the power of the air. And I, I know there's weather conditions and a natural rain process, but he, nevertheless, that's what the Bible calls. And when you read the book of Job, you think all of that was caused by Satan over trying to afflict Job. Those coming up in a second resurrection will have a period of time, perhaps 100 years. The, the scriptures talk about a 100-year period where the old man, the infant, you know, have time to grow and, and live their life, make their choice. After seeing how the earth has been transformed, transformed to look like the Garden of Eden, do you think anybody would reject it? I hope not. God is not willing that any should be lost. That's in 2 Peter 3, 9. And he has provided a plan where few will be lost. You know, it may be rough getting there, but it's going to get there. The physical world, both terrestrial and celestial, will come to an end. You don't hear very many people talking about that. It will come to an end after Satan is cast into the lake of fire. In 2 Peter 3, 10 through 13, and I'll read these by word verbatim. But the day of the Lord will come as a thief in the night, in the which in thee which the heavens shall pass away with a great noise. And the elements shall melt with fervent heat. The earth also, and the works that are therein shall be burned up. This physical universe will come to an end. Seeing then that all these things shall be dissolved, you know, when you dissolve something, it disappears. 
dissolved, what manner of persons ought you to be in all holy conversation and godliness, looking for and hasting unto the coming of the day of God? We're in the we're we're in the heavens, being on fire, shall be dissolved, and the elements shall melt with fervent heat. Nevertheless, we, according to his promise, look for a new heaven and a new earth, where, wherein dwelt righteousness. The recreation was foretold of in Isaiah. I'll read some of that. Isaiah 65, 17. For behold, this is the long time before Christ and the apostles told us about it. For behold, I create new heavens and a new earth, and the former shall not be remembered, nor come into mind. God the Father and Jesus Christ will make their home on this new earth. Most nominal believers have been deceived to think they're going to go to heaven. It was, that's a pagan gospel. They think they're going to be up there with the angels playing harps and wearing these little shiny halos. And that's the picture that we get. And it all came from paganism. Uh, a lot of it from Dante's Inferno. I may, some of it may have existed before then, but the majority of false uh, beliefs in Christianity come from that. Remember, Jesus said that no man has gone to heaven except the one that came down from heaven. That's in John 3.13. He followed up by saying that whosoever believes in him shall not perish, but have eternal life. Do we believe that? That it is there. It is an offer. Those who think they're going to heaven actually think the Bible says that. They have been lied to because the Bible doesn't say anything about it, does it? Most of us know that. I know you know that. Revelation 21, 21. That scripture will fulfill Jesus' promise. In my house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you. I go to prepare a place for you. The place is the new heavens and the new earth. John 14, 2. He did that, and there is a place prepared for you in the house of God. He did go and prepare a place. But not if it's rejected for a counterfeit gospel, a counterfeit belief. Occasionally, I still hear somebody say something that is, doesn't fit with what we understand. Uh, maybe it's just a slip of a tongue. We all do that. Satan will have been cast out of this new world. He, won't, he will not enter the new world at all because he will have been removed permanently. Now is the judgment of this world. Now shall the prince of this world be cast out. He won't be there. That's in John 12, 31. To finally be cast out of this world, and then the world passes away that you were in, I would think that would make Satan homeless, wouldn't it? <laughs> but in Hebrews 2, 14, it tells us something different. It says, Jesus destroys Satan, the devil. Satan knows his fate, and he wants to share it. You know, as the old saying, what is it, misery loves company? I'm sure Satan wants to take as many with him as he can. You will be in God's wonderful kingdom unless you choose a different way, whether you make a conscious choice to not be there. For the living know that they shall die, but the dead know not anything. Neither have they any more reward, the mem for the memory of them is forgotten. Ecclesiastes 9.5. You know, Solomon said some wise things. Whether he truly understood it, I don't know. But he certainly did contribute to a lot of wisdom. The story about where Jesus went and what he did is history. I'm telling you the good news that he brought in kind of a simplistic form. Let's be like the Bereans. If we wish to understand more, then search the Bible to prove what it actually says. You know, I've, I've heard it said many times, you know, God will reveal truth. Uh, and many of you read that in our book. It's about God will reveal some basic simple truth. And if you act on it, you'll get more truth. 
If you reject that, you may not get anything. <laughs> the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. A good understanding have all they that do his commandments. His praise endures forever. That is in Psalm 111, verse 10. And in Ecclesiastes 12, verse 7, it says this. Then shall the dust return to the earth as it was, and the spirit shall return unto God who gave it. That is how God can restore us, all those who died, who are resurrected. Your thoughts, your memories, who you are is safely stored with God. It is like you're in a deep sleep, but only God can wake you up. Psalms 104, 29 through 30. Thou hidest thy face, they are troubled. Thou takest away their breath, they die, and return to their dust. You send forth thy spirit, they are created. And thou renewest the face of the earth. God's spirit can do anything that God wills. Anything. The end of this world is the beginning of forever. And this is only chapter one. <laughs> yeah. Now, what we're doing, do you know what we're doing is we are doing a memorial of something? You know, I, on trumpets it says a memorial of trumpets, but we are memorializing God's plan by keeping the holy days. It's a testament. It's a witness to the world that... that of uh, what God says is going to happen, symbolically. <clears throat> Blessed are those who have ears to hear and a heart that believes. Our hope should be that everyone who has the opportunity to share in God's kingdom will accept it. We call this Happy Memorial Day. 